The viral growth of the Occupy movement and the public support of it is testament to the tremendous dissatisfaction with the inequities and abuses of corporate capitalism. The slogan, we are the 99%, is resonating with many people. What is your view of the potential strength of this type of mass protest and its possibility to affect social change? Well, the Occupy movement already has had a number of uh, significant successes. Uh, one of them, as you say, is to uh, uh, kind of change the national discourse of these concerns and uh, fears and so on were, of course, prevalent uh, for a long time for perfectly objective reasons, having to do with changes in the uh, socioeconomic system in the last 30 or 40 years. Uh, but they weren't uh, crystallized uh, very clearly until the Occupy movement put them forward. And now they're kind of common coin. So 99% and 1%, the uh, um, radical equality, the uh, uh, farcical character of purchased elections, uh, uh, the uh, corporate shenanigans that uh, led to the current crisis and have been crushing people for a long time, the overseas wars and so on. Uh, what are the, uh, th that's one major contribution. The other one is uh, not discussed so much, but I think it's pretty important. Uh, the, this is an extremely atomized society. Uh, people are alone. There it's, uh, the, uh, it's a very business-run society, and the very explicit goal of the business world is to create a social order in which the uh, basic social unit is you and your television set. Uh, in which you're watching ads and going out to purchase commodities. And there's a tremendous uh, efforts made to, uh, it's gone on, going on for a century and a half, uh, to try to induce this kind of uh, con consciousness and uh, social order. In fact, if you go back, say, 150 years, the early days of the Industrial Revolution, uh, right here in Massachusetts where it started, uh, well, there was very lively uh, 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 a press at the time, uh, probably the period of the greatest free press in the United States, uh, all kinds of press, uh, ethnic, labor, uh, anything. And the labor press, which was extremely interesting and lively and participatory, had a great many uh, uh, harsh uh, criticisms of the industrial system that was being imposed into which people were being driven. Uh, but the, one of the core criticisms was what 150 years ago they called the new spirit of the age, gain wealth forgetting all but self, which they considered, you know, savage and inhuman and it was being trying to driven into their heads. Well, 150 years later, they're still trying to drive it into people's heads. Gain wealth, forgetting all but self, and now it's considered a kind of an ideal, but it's also intolerable to human beings. Uh, one effect of the Occupy movement has been simply to spontaneously create small social systems of uh, solidarity, mutual support, uh, cooperation, uh, uh, cooperative kitchens, uh, libraries, and health services. Uh, general assemblies in which people actually interact and so on. That's something very much missing in the society. And uh, when we talk about potential, uh, part of the potential would be to, first of all, maintain those bonds and associations uh, after the tactic has outlived its usefulness and tactics do outlive their usefulness. Uh, but after that happens, if the uh, what has been learned and internalized can be sustained and extended, well, that would be very important in itself. Uh, the other dimension is how much can you engage uh, the rest of the so-called 99% in these uh, uh, activities, concerns, uh, um, interactions, and so on. That's the next big step that has to be taken. Many in the Occupy movement have realized that political democracy is controlled by big money.
Few, however, have expressed that economic democracy is essential for a truly democratic society. The progressive utilization theory or Prout advocates economic democracy to empower people and communities through cooperative management of most enterprises. Economic democracy requires that the minimum requirements of life be guaranteed to everyone and decision-making be decentralized so people have the right to choose how their local economies are run. It's the responsibility of all levels of government to promote policies that achieve full employment. Do you think that economic democracy and local economies could move us forward? Well, first of all, this is the traditional stand of the left. So if you go back again 150 years ago to these same newspapers I was mentioning, one of their demands was that those who work in the mills should own them and, of course, manage them. Uh, that was the slogan of uh, the Knights of Labor, the major huge labor organization that developed in the 19th century. Uh, European socialism was mostly, I mean, had several branches, but uh, the, the, the more left branches, if you like, were essentially the same, uh, committed to workers' councils, uh, community uh, organizations, uh, guild socialism in England was the same. I mean, this is the traditional thrust of the socialist movement. Uh, it's not understood here because, as I said again, this is a very business-run society. You're not allowed to know any of these things. So socialism is some kind of bad word, you know. Well, okay, that's what happens in a highly controlled society. A highly indoctrinated society, but these are very familiar goals. And yes, in fact, they're, uh, you can go to the, the, the leading social philosopher in the United States, who everyone recognizes, is John Dewey, who just took this for granted. Uh, his, as he put it, uh, unless every institution in society, uh, uh, industry, uh, farming, uh, communications, media, um, if all of them, unless they're under popular democratic control by participation by the workforce in the community. Uh, he said, uh, politics will just be the shadow cast over society by big business. Well, that's the alternative. You can't have meaningful political democracy without functioning economic democracy. And I think this is uh, at some level understood by uh, working people. It has to be brought to awareness and consciousness, but it's just below the surface. And in fact, things are happening. So uh, some of the most interesting are uh, uh, around the, in Ohio, around the Cleveland area, Cleveland Project. There's uh, a dozen, maybe hundreds of, uh, uh, not huge, but uh, significant enterprises that are worker-owned, worker-managed. Uh, in some places, there are in, uh, the biggest one, the biggest worker-owned uh, collection of conglomerate is Mondragon and uh, the Basque Country. That's worker-owned, but not worker-managed. And it's uh, you know uh, industries, banks, uh, schools, and uh, communities, very uh, broad uh, configuration. And there are various other elements of it uh, here and there. Uh, a couple of quite good books have just come out about it, one by Gar Garl Perovitz, America Beyond Capitalism, which is about the worker-owned uh, enterprises uh, that are sprouting around the country. And this could go much beyond. So for example, uh, just look, a, about a couple of years ago, um, the government effectively nationalized the auto industry, came pretty close to it. And there were a couple of choices. Uh, one choice, which is the uh, the choice that's reflexive in a business-run system, is to reconstitute it, uh, hand it back to the original owners or people very much like them, and let them pursue the same course they were pursuing before. It's one possibility. That was, of course, the choice that was undertaken without discussion. But there was another choice, and if there had been a live, functioning Occupy movement at the time, it could have put that other choice onto the national agenda. It had to be much more 
larger and more organized than it is now, but this is only a few months after all. Uh, the other choice was to hand the auto industry over to the workers in the community uh, and have them uh, own and manage and run it and have it directed to things that the country needs. Now, there are, after all, things that we very badly need as a society. Uh, one of the most obvious is high-speed rail. The United States is just off the international spectrum in this respect. And it's a kind of a scandal. It's, uh, it's economically harmful and socially harmful, just uh, humanly harmful. Ecologically harmful. Um, ecologically harmful. I mean, everything you can think of is just ridiculous. And the skilled workforce in the what's called the Rust Belt could easily be uh, reconfigured to do that. So people like Seymour Melman had been arguing about that, for, arguing for that for years. It might take some kind of federal aid, or but uh, you know, nothing like what was say poured into the banks. And uh, to make this even more ironic, at the very time that Obama was reconstituting the auto industry and handing it back to normal ownership. He was also sending his transportation secretary to Spain to get contracts for high-speed rail from the Spanish, who are way more advanced than we are, or the French or the Germans. Uh, and here you have this industrial system sitting there, uh, workers wanting to work, uh, communities wanting to have their own lively work-based communities, and uh, the country needing things badly, but they can't be put together. Uh, that's quite a, uh, we, uh, we have to go somewhere else, like to Spain, to get them to help us out. I mean, it's an incredible condemnation of the uh, uh, semi-functioning system. And that's the kind of thing that a, an Occupy movement, when it moves beyond this particular tactic, uh, should be uh, addressing. And things like that are happening all over the country. There was one right here about two years ago. Uh, uh, a small but a sophisticated manufacturing enterprise, pretty successful in uh, one of the Boston suburbs, uh, was producing specialized uh, equipment for aircraft. I don't remember what it was. And uh, the multinational that owned it wanted to shut it down, maybe not make enough profit for them or something. Uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the union, uh, UE, pretty progressive union, and the workforce offered to buy it and run it themselves with community support. Well, uh, the company wouldn't agree. I, I suspect they lost money on it, but the problem, I don't know, but I suspect just for class reasons, the idea of a worker-owned, worker-managed, successful enterprise does, is not appealing. Whatever the reasons, they closed it down. And so now that town doesn't have the industry in which it's partly based. Well, you know, again, uh, with a, a, a live, progressive, activist movement that reached out to many parts of the community, uh, that could have been salvaged. And there are things like that all over. So yes, it's uh, the right thing to do. It's uh, uh, deeply ingrained in the American tradition. Uh, and it's been suppressed by uh, the nature of uh, uh, a highly class-conscious uh, business class, which is always, without stop, fighting a bitter class war. They know exactly what they're doing. It's very coordinated and controlled. And it's, uh, I mean, it's true everywhere, but it's especially so in the United States. It happens to be unusual in this respect. We see many consequences of it. Let's go on about the 1%. Uh, because the physical resources of the planet are limited, the hoarding of wealth, or using it for speculation rather than productive investment, reduces the opportunities for other people and causes poverty. A fundamental principle of Prout is to limit the accumulation of wealth and create a maximum salary that's tied to the minimum wage, just as all the salaries in all the forms of government of the United States have pay scales where the starting salary is no, no, le no more than 10 times what the highest you know, pay scale is for a president or a general or a president or a judge. You know. So what is your opinion about limiting the accumulation of wealth? Well, 
Uh, first of all, there are much more far-reaching goals than that. So another traditional uh, ideal of the left movements has been uh, uh, from each according to his ability, uh, his ability to each according to his need. And actually, that's a pretty popular idea. Uh, there was in 1976, on the 200th anniversary of the Declaration of Independence, there were polls taken uh, asking people, uh, what do you think is it? Giving them lists of kind of statements, and they were supposed to judge which ones do you think are in the Constitution. Well, no, nobody knows what's in the Constitution, so the question that they're answering is, which ones are obvious truisms? So they must be in the Constitution. Uh, this one uh, was got a considerable majority. Uh, you know, I, th I think people think, yeah, that makes sense. Uh, the uh, a pay scale issue is uh, it's, it's one reflection of. Uh, first of all, the a, a lot of it has to do with financialization of the economy. But this is a new phenomenon. I mean, of course, there's always been finance. There's always been um, you know. Uh, uh, the financial crashes and so on, but uh, there was a big change in the 1970s. Uh, the uh, a New Deal had instituted uh, an array of regulations, uh, among which were uh, uh, regulations which um, essentially determined that banks were banks. That is, they were to do what a bank is supposed to do in a state capitalist economy. You can argue that it's the wrong kind of economy. I would, for example, I suppose you would, but in that kind of economy, banks have a function. Uh, they're supposed to take unused capital, somebody's bank account, and uh, transmit it to uh, some kind of productive action, like starting a business or buying a house or whatever it may be. And they more or less did that. There were no crashes in the 50s and the 60s, uh, the biggest crush growth period in American history, also a period of extremely, by our standards, current standards, very high taxation of the wealthy, mm -hmm. uh, very fast growth, egalitarian growth, uh, no crashes. Well, that changed in the 70s and accelerated under Reagan. Uh, the, uh, and there was, uh, with uh, a freeing up of constraints on capital, so uh, the currencies, had been more or less regulated. They were freed. Uh, the uh, uh, other constraints on capital were dropped. So you had a huge explosion of speculative capital just kind of overwhelmed capital markets uh, by now, by 2007, right before the latest crash. Uh, and the next one will come later. Is uh, 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 Financial institutions had about 40% of uh, corporate profits. And they weren't helping the economy. In fact, one of the, maybe the most uh, respected financial correspondent in the world is, uh, at least the English-speaking world, is uh, Martin Wolf of the Financial Times. Uh, he simply describes these institutions as uh, like uh, larvas that attach to a host and eat it away from the inside. The host that he's talking about is the market system, which of course he approves of. He says they're just eating it away from the inside, cites figures showing how harmful they are. Uh, uh, but they do accumulate a lot of capital for in very few hands. And that's one of the reasons that led to the pretty sharp concentration of income. The 1% uh, image is a little misleading because it's really one-tenth of 1% that's uh, where you find the enormous uh, 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 concentration of wealth. You go down below in the one percent, and you know the wealthy, but not uh, not by spectacular standards. So yes, it, it uh, concentrated wealth in a tiny percentage of uh, uh, the society. Uh, um, substantially, uh, hedge fund managers, uh, CEOs of financial corporations, and so on, and that uh, translates itself almost reflexively into political power. Uh, you also had at the same time, in parallel, the sharp rise in uh, uh, spending for elections. So, by, of course, by now it's just totally out of sight. It's right on the front pages. But, uh, uh, but by the early 80s, it was already substantially increasing. Uh, that compels the parties to 
dig into corporate profits. And the people say unions and corporations, but it's essentially corporations, that's where the money is. Uh, and increasingly financial corporations, so they increasingly essentially buy the elections. Uh, they also buy Congress in many ways. So for example, in, I suppose the United States is the only parliamentary system where, and very recently incidentally, it wasn't true before, where uh, to get a position of some influence in Congress, a, a chair of a committee, uh, which used to accrue to seniority and uh, service in some fashion, now you just have to pay the party. Uh, and then you can qualify to the chair, so that drives uh, the rest of you into the same pockets. Now, the Republicans stopped even pretending to be a political party about 20 years ago or so. And now they're just uh, totally enthralled to the one-tenth of one percent. One of the reasons the Republican debates are such a total farce is that in order, mo in order to mobilize voters, they can't come to the voters with their actual policies. Nobody would vote for them. So they have to appeal to uh, pretty unpleasant tendencies in the population that have always been there but are now mobilized. And you get, a, you get the picture. You, you see there, I won't go through it. It's, the world can't believe what, what they're seeing. You know. uh, but it's a natural result of, uh, high, of, of the fact that the party uh, essentially abandoned any pretense of being a parliamentary party in the normal sense, and has just driven into the service of the one fraction of 1%. Uh, the, uh, uh, the Democrats aren't that far behind. I mean, the Democrats are what used to be called moderate Republicans. They've all been kicked out of the party. In fact, if, if you look, some, somebody like, say, Eisenhower, would be considered a radical leftist in the current spectrum. Nixon, pretty much on the left. You know, even Reagan would be more or less on the left. But uh, and those are changes that have taken place since the, since the seventies, particularly eighties. Well, uh, at one consequence, uh, another aspect of this was deregulation. Another, which of course led predictably to repeatable crashes ever since the Reagan years. And another element was changes in corporate governance. Uh, rules of corporate governance. So, for example, by now, a, uh, in fact, for the last 30 years, a CEO can effectively uh, choose the board that grants him salary and stock options. Well, you can predict what's going to happen from that. So now, if you compare, say, the United States and Europe, you know, pretty similar societies, the ratio of pay uh, to top management uh, as compared with workers, is far higher here than in comparable societies, and not because they're more talented, as maybe David Brooks will tell you, and so on, or because they perform any services. In fact, they mostly probably harm the economy, uh, but just because, you know, if, like if uh, you tell people you can pick your own salary, well, okay. Uh, so yes, that's a big problem, and if the United States were to Say, just to return to what it was, nothing very utopian, or to be like other industrial societies, it was not a very good model, but uh, you know, certainly not utopian. Then this vast uh, chasm between uh, top uh, uh, remuneration and uh, the workforce would sharply shrink. But my feeling is that's nowhere near enough. Uh, we ought to be, have as an ideal at least, the traditional left ideal, uh, you, uh, 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 there's kind of a conception of work that underlies this. Uh, there are different conceptions of what work is. This is, comes right out of the debates that during the Enlightenment. Uh, one conception is work is something that you have to be driven to. You wouldn't do it unless you were uh, forced by starvation. Uh, it's something you hate, but you have to do because you can't live otherwise. Uh, that's basically the capitalist conception of work. Uh, there's another conception which says work is the highest ideal in life. Uh, free creative work under your own control is exactly what any uh, human being would choose if they could. And uh, there are places where that ideal is practiced. Like if you walk down the halls at MIT, you'll find people working you know, maybe 80 hours a week uh, they could make a lot more money in the stock market, but they're doing it because they love it. 
uh, you have uh, you, you have pr things you'd like to do. If you, I, I mean, I know uh, um, carpenters who are the same way. In their spare time, they go out in the shed and make in interesting, good things. It's what they like to do. Uh, that's a different conception of work. Now, for, if under the second conception, basically the Enlightenment conception, there's no reason why uh, that pay should uh, relate to the amount of work you do. It has nothing to do with it. You do the work even if you aren't being paid. Uh, if the work is under your own control, under your own choice. I mean, a, a kind of a graphic Enlightenment uh, uh, image of this actually by one of the founders of classical liberalism, Wilhelm von Humboldt, was that uh, uh, if an artisan uh, produces a beautiful object on command, we admire what he did, but we despise what he is, namely a tool in the hands of others. On the other hand, if he creates it under his own will and choice, and out of his own concerns and interests, we admire what he did and who he is. Actually, Adam Smith said, Pretty similar things. These are, you know, these are traditional conservative ideas. If the word conservative has any meaning, uh, but the capitalist conception is quite different. You work only under a lash, and therefore those who uh, allegedly work harder, actually they don't, uh, should get uh, you know multi-million dollar stock options. But uh, 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 these are just extremely different conceptions. And they lead to all sorts of different uh, ideas about how a society would be organized. Mm -hmm. You have written on that slavery, the oppression of women and working people, and other severe violations of human rights have been able to endure in part because, in various ways, the values of the oppressors have been internalized by the victims. That is why consciousness raising is often the first step in liberation. What do you think are the most important ways to raise consciousness, to free us from the values of the oppressors that are stuck inside us? I should say that, again, I don't take any credit for that view. It's a very old one. Right. Uh, you can read uh, David Hume, for example, right. another one of the founders of classical liberalism, right. great philosopher, uh, wrote... Uh, uh, found, uh, wrote on foundations of government, and he said, uh, he said the first principle of government, he said, is uh, uh, something that is that strikes him when he looks at history. He was also a historian that uh, he's struck by the easiness with which the uh, the governed accept the rule of the governs governors, and he says this is paradoxical because power is in the hands of the governed. Uh, power is not in the hands of the rulers. Uh, so how is this miracle maintained? Well, he said it's by control of opinion. Uh, if the governors can control opinion and attitude then impose uh, the, what later was called false consciousness that you were describing, you know, then they can rule. But if you can break that, uh, then they're gone. They can't stand up against the governed. So how do you break it? Well, all the ways we know. Uh, so, say, take uh, slavery. I mean, there were first of all, it was there was never a peaceful period of slavery. There were always slave revolts. The slave families found their own ways of uh, constructing uh, islands of freedom within the sadistic society that they were part of, and uh, uh, occasionally these led to actual major revolts, which were violently crushed. Uh, uh, the uh, uh, finally, you know, it led to uh, after far too long, of course, it did lead to uh, abolitionism and uh, formal elimination of slavery. Though we should note formal, uh, because in fact, in many ways, it still remains. Uh, even uh, well, I mean, the Civil War, technically. Uh, uh, amendments, constitutional amendments during the Civil War did in fact formally end slavery, but it was reconstituted about 10 years later by criminalization of black life, North-South Compact, which essentially reconstituted it. And, uh, yeah, and now it's, uh, we're, getting, we're going through something like that now. Take a look at the incarceration rate. The, uh, but take, say, uh, women's rights. 
well, that's more, re uh, that of course also goes far back, but it didn't really become a, a substantial movement until the 1970s. Now, there were germs of it in the 60s and 60s activism, but, uh, and, and the way it began was uh, small consciousness raising groups, uh, groups of women talking to each other and uh, they're trying to break through the uh, general assumption that this is the way it has to be. There are no choices. Uh, women are supposed to be property. In fact, if you look at American law, the women remained essentially property well into the 1970s. Some ways still are. I mean, there was no legal right for women to uh, serve on juries until 1975, Supreme Court judgment. Uh, well, you know, it, it developed among, mostly among women. It was a big crisis inside the activist movements, incidentally, in the 60s, uh, when young men who were doing very courageous things like resistance had to somehow face the fact that they too are oppressors. That was difficult. It actually led to suicide in some cases, but it's a hard thing to deal with. But slowly it spread through much of the society, and now a lot of it's just taken for granted. And not everywhere, but you know, not Rick Santorum, but uh, quite broadly. Uh, and that's the way things change. It was the same with workers' rights and everything else. Um, there's no magic. We know that we know how to do it. It's just a matter of doing it. I uh, live in Venezuela. Do you have any message for the people of Latin America and the Caribbean who are trying to free themselves from domination by the United States? Well, what's happened in the last decade south of the border is pretty spectacular. I mean, it's of real historic importance. If, if you think over history uh, for 500 years, uh, Latin America was uh, dominated overwhelmingly. Internationally, it was dominated by imperial powers. The first European powers in the United States. Internally, there was a reflection of that. Now, the typical Latin American society had a small, super wealth, wealthy elite, 1%, uh, if you like, uh, mostly Europeanized, often white. Uh, uh, they concentrated the wealth of the society, the tremendous uh, misery and oppression in pretty rich societies, societies that should be quite wealthy. Uh, the, uh, uh, and the ruling elites were uh, Western-oriented. I mean, their capital flowed to the West. Uh, they didn't invest it at home. Uh, they, uh, uh, they, they imported cons uh, luxury goods. Uh, the children went to colleges in, you know, Europe and the United States. They had second homes on the Riviera, you know, that kind of thing. So they're basically a European, including the U.S., a West, uh, uh, you know, I don't know no word for it, but a Western implant inside their own societies, ruling it very brutally. Well, uh, and the countries were separated from one another. I mean, they didn't have roads connecting each other. Uh, they were just oriented to the, to the West and the U.S. Well, that's changed in the last 10 years. This half a millennium pattern is changing radically. Uh, the countries are beginning to integrate. That's a prerequisite for independence. Uh, they're uh, uh, beginning to face some of their internal problems, which are very severe, uh, at doing it in different ways in different countries, but it's happening throughout the continent. The indigenous movements, which are the most repressed uh, part of the population, those who survived, uh, have uh, 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 gained considerable uh, 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 both organization and even power in Bolivia. They run the government in Ecuador. They're a strong part of the uh, um, social political order. Conflicts with the government, but fighting for their own interests. And uh, uh, all of these changes are very important. In fact, they may save the planet. Uh, the, uh, around the world, whether it's Australia or Latin America or anywhere else, the indigenous movements are in the forefront of trying to do something to save the planet, human species, from self-destruction. In uh, uh, Bolivia and Ecuador, the two countries with the most strongest indigenous movements, they've, uh, there's now uh, legislation uh, 
in Ecuador, I think it's in the Constitution, right. to, uh, uh, for what's called rights of nature. Right. And uh, these are traditional parts of indigenous culture, uh, just totally marginalized by industrialization. And unless the, that consciousness spreads, we're all doomed. You know. So there's both for themselves and uh, for the world, some very striking things have happened. Uh, it's, uh, uh, I mean, the, the U.S. used to take Latin America completely for granted. It was called uh, our little region over here, you know, which... Uh, backyard. Yeah, our backyard, you know. And uh, it, it was taken for granted, unless we can control Latin America, it can't control the rest of the world. In fact, that was stated repeatedly. All right, the U.S. has lost it. Not all of it, you know, but South America, for example, there isn't a single U.S. military base left which is a pretty significant fact. Now, the U.S. isn't giving up. The last, uh, so the training of Latin American officers has increased. Uh, they're being trained to combat what's called radical populism, which means, you know, troublesome priests who organize peasants, uh, human rights activists, and so on. We know how that works in Latin America. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, most interesting case right now is Colombia. That was the last holdout for the United States in South America. Uh, uh, the U.S. did, Bush and Obama, uh, tried to get control of seven, at least access to seven military bases in Colombia. And there was a lot of furor about that on, on the continent, a lot of protest. Well, the Colombian Constitutional Court uh, uh, blocked it. But the U.S. is still constructing the bases. Uh, so they are, are evidently hoping that they can somehow over, overrule the rulings of the court and get them through. And there's a confrontation, a significant confrontation going on in Colombia about uh, the legacy of the uh, U.S. Uh, domination, which was pretty monstrous. Uh, 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 Central America and the Caribbean are much weaker societies. And Smaller. Small, weak, separated, and there it's easier, though not totally easy anymore, to control them. So the coup in Honduras, which the U.S. backed, I mean, it claimed not to back it, but effectively ended up backing it, uh, I'm sh pretty sure is related to the fact that uh, Honduras is one of the countries where there are the major U.S. military bases. The Palmarola Air Base, for one, was it was the main base for um, supporting the Contras, for example. And uh, there are bases, there are number American bases, U.S. bases spread all through that region, and also in the Caribbean islands, the Dutch islands, and so on. Uh, but uh, it's it's not the direction things are going. Uh, so one significant move, at least symbolically, was the. Uh, uh, formation, I think it was last summer, finally, the first meeting of, uh, in Caracas of uh, uh, CELAC, the, uh, uh, the, uh, an organization which includes every country of the Western Hemisphere except for the United States and Canada. And that's at least symbolically very significant. If it becomes a functioning organization, it, its intention, I presume, is to replace the OAS. Or, Organization of American States, which is U.S. dominated, and uh, it includes Cuba, excludes the United States and Canada. Well, uh, if all of these things are in the same direction, they're a move towards uh, uh, dismantling the system of external control and internal domination. Both are proceeding in parallel, and they're both very significant. 